Everyone I've spoke to has different different takes on it. For uh, you, what do you feel your differences are working in daytime compared to prime time compared to major film? Daytime, uh, daytime is like it's almost like doing it's almost like you're doing improv theater in a way, but you know right. your lines, and um, you just got to be in the moment. With improv theater, there's never a no. There's no no's there. You know, you got to keep the thing going to make it the joke. So with soaps, being the format that it is, um, you know, it's, it's different. You're on a different kind of sound stage. You know, the cameras are different. The lighting is different, and especially now. With the cameras, come on, man. That's, come on, come on, man. Come on, man. So that's a trip. And it's just, uh, it's a format that's fast. Very fast. It is, it's a very fast format. That's why I say find your place, find your rhythm, find what's real for you, and stay there. Make everybody come play where you are. That's what I would do. And, you know, at that time, there was nothing but actors who was just killing it, killing it, right? They were killing it. So I think it's the hardest forum, man. I think I tell, I tell, it I tell Josh more on them all the time. I said, dude, I said, you know what? Like, you know, being on a primetime set, it's like relaxed at times. And there when I'm seeing the pace and the amount of dialogue they have to remember, 15, 20, 30, 40 pages of dialogue a day. And I'm just like, how do you process all of that information in such a you, short period of time in one take it gets it gets it gets easier mm -hmm. right because uh you get into a groove of the whole thing just like when you're working on a regular prime time show uh you know how to get to where you need to go and find where you need to go but there was plenty of nights especially over the weekends where i would sit on my balcony and i would um i would have to learn 50 to 75 pages over the weekend for right. monday and that's just the show for Monday, Tuesday. Mm -hmm. I'll work on Wednesday, Sunday night. So when, when Sunday night, I would d dedicate myself to learning what's Wednesday and Thursday. And, you know, I would just break it down. And I would learn, if it's 20 pages, I would learn 10. And mm -hmm. once I have that 10 down, I would learn another five. And I would just break it down like that. Just like, when, you know, in martial arts, when you're learning your punce or your katas, you know, I mm -hmm. used to break them down into four parts. So I would just break everything down. It's different now, but that process, I had to learn that process because that was the only way to get through that process because that format is no joke, period. Mm -hmm. Hats off. If I had my hat on, I would take it off, seriously. Yeah. Because it's no joke. So there it is. So for you, the, I mean, make, for you, you, you were a, a very, very, very well-known, good great football athlete and no i, would, I wouldn't say all that it, if, if if you blink you miss my career so which i'm cool with i still <laughs> I, I still i still i still have the aches and pains so you know it, it, it's 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 what it is i was uh, a former athlete so trust me i feel it trust you me, know feel yeah yeah you know it's like wait a minute when did that start hurting <laughs> you know mm. so but i mean for uh, you for you for, for you in the sense number one like what what put you on the path from saying, uh, okay, I mean, I had to make the same choice myself. It was like, stay on the path as an athlete, even right. though I had a major injury, but I was destined to like, it was always, you know, my thing to play professional baseball. Right. But I ended up being stupid one year because, you uh -huh. know, as a, as a young kid growing up, a black kid in a dominantly white neighborhood, Mm -hmm. You get into a lot of you're gonna get, you get, yeah, you're gonna get in some scrapes, man. Exactly. And and for me, my teachers and stuff growing up were always like, you know, you're not a bad kid. You just have a and, and this is I think for me was what drew me to the arts of entertainment. I started off as a musician, but first it was sports. But they're always like, you know, you have some little anger problems that you need to work out. And so one year, you know, my, 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 I remember my guidance counselor, he was like, you know what, you ever thought about playing football? Because like for me, whenever I walked into a school, I was always bigger 
than the other kids, even at a younger age. So I'd walk in, you know, say at like elementary, mm -hmm. and they're like, Are you sure you're not supposed to be in high school? And wow. I remember number one, like him saying to me, you know, do you ever think about, you know, playing football? And I was like, no, baseball my, is my passion. But right. then I looked at it, I was like, okay, this is a way, I, I'm like, I get to go into a field, put on a helmet, and kick the shit out of people. Trust me, bro. Fun doing it. Trust so me. So I'm like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use that outlet. And this was around the time, I guess you would say, you know, Bo Jackson was dabbling between football and baseball. Yeah. Deion Sanders yeah. was dabbling between football yeah. and baseball. So, I, so in my mind, I was like, if they can do it, yeah. I can do it. Yeah. So I got into the into playing football and my and as I said I was I, I was I had a whole bunch of different scouts looking at me for different, you know, universities or stuff to go to to play. And the first year of playing football, I broke my wrist in three different places. Wow. Like snapped it in half, twisted it, bone popped out, running back ran over my wrist, crushed it. And for me that that was the end of my football career, but it also started the process of the end of my baseball career right. because I was never the same physically right. and mentally. And I tell people, number one, it was like, you know, that I always say that, you know, sometimes the, the worst things that happen to you can lead you on to the best things yeah. that can happen for you. Yeah. And, you know, and that's what led me in saying, okay, you know what, maybe I could do this, acting, producing thing for real, because I always had a creative outlet. And I was like, this is this is a way for me to express myself without, I mean, yes, we do the action stunts and stuff like that. Yeah. But you, because you that's, what, you know, that's what football did for all of us, you know, you, mm -hmm. you know, it, especially if, you know, if you want to learn how to, you know, throw, throw them dogs, whatever it is, mm -hmm. you know, that's exactly what it is. I'm right there with you. I made, you know, I had friends who were in the business in, in high school and, Jim Bridges Jr., I went to high school at Northwestern. We went to okay. Northwestern together. You know, and his little brother is, is Todd Bridges, and, you know, their mom was a manager, pops was an agent, so, you know, I started off doing the commercial thing. All right. But for me, when I got my knee injured and <laughs> the doctor left me a little cartilage in there, I was like, all right. I literally went to my mama's house with my cleats, went in the garage, and nailed him. And hung up my cleats. I'm like, I'm done, right? I literally hung them up. I hung, I hung the uh, my black Adidas cleats that I took from, uh, well, I, you know, I didn't take, but from the Vikings. And uh, I remember putting them up there because I always hated black cleats. But now I'm like, man, that's kind of cool. Black, black kicks would be cool if you were playing with the Vikings right now. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I just tried to start that mindset of uh, making tr making the transition. Uh, I will say, and I'll be totally honest with this, being a football player did open doors because I was willing to do the sports shit. I was willing to do that. But once I started accumulating more knowledge as an actor and doing more plays and showcases and starting to get cast and a lot of things, um, I cut that off completely. <clears throat> Because you can stay in that whole thing and be that guy yeah, for a while. Until it, it, yeah, until it plays out. You know, again, just like you said, I want to go do some Denzel, Lawrence Fishburne, you know, uh, Brad Pitt, George Clooney stuff. I wanted to go. You know, I wanted to get out there and do all these other things uh, because I had all these emotions, you know, growing up mm -hmm. in, in, in South Central. Now, I didn't grow up in a bad neighborhood or, you know, nobody in my family was, you know, on crack or nothing like that. You know, our lawn was manicured. Mom's is a UCLA grad. And so and my stepdad had his own little small trucking company. And so, um, you know, we didn't, my little brother and I didn't want for anything. We just had to make sure we did what we were supposed to do. Or we got our asses caved in, you know, because they didn't play. Mm -hmm. So that kept me straight. And, um, you know, I always wanted to see the world and, and experience things and experience different people and being a, you know, being a, uh, uh, African-American teenager and young man and doing all these things, you know, you see how people treat you both good and bad. And, um, 
you know, if you want to be a, a person of the world, a, at least a halfway decent human being, mm -hmm. um, you have to experience other cultures and do things and, you know, accept the ebb and flow again. And again, apply that to what you're doing. Apply it to what you're doing. Right. One of the biggest compliments, I, I've had several big compliments in my, my, my lifetime as an actor. And Tidy was a, was, a, was a cat that used to keep my head on straight, especially in my earlier career, because, you know, the South Central. We all need it, man. The we South Central and me will come out and I'll be like, yo, uh, what did he say? Yeah, I, what? You know? Uh, so uh, once everything started tapping in for me, we were shoot, when we were shooting Virus, um, you know, I'm there with Donald Sutherland, Cliff Curtis. It's funny you Jamie. said Donald Sutherland. Keeper Sutherland is actually my mentor. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, Toronto, right? So yeah. uh, I remember one day we were shooting this scene where my character goes crazy and he takes this, uh, uh, this uh, grenade launcher that's connected to the bottom, his uh, MR2. Okay. It's connected to the bottom of uh, the, his AK, right? He rigs it up. I rig it up, right? Blow the hole open. And I was just, when I was doing that, I was just thinking about what if I was in this situation and this biomechanoid creature was trying to, you know, kill me and use mm -hmm. parts of me, right? I would go straight South Central on this cat, on everybody, right? So all I remember was when I blow the hole open, I just started screaming and I just blurted out this line that Woods is dead and I don't have nobody to carry my shit because he was my, he was my mule, you know, throughout the film. And I'm like, who's going to carry my shit? Who's going to, you know, and I just went nuts. And I was actually like, I got to carry this shit around because once you're married, you know, uh, who was it? It was, uh, I forgot who told me this, but he said, look, if you're ever doing something and you got to carry this sword, Badlands, or you got to carry this, this luggage or whatever, mm -hmm. and you, in, in your shooting in order, make sure you put the lightest shit in there because you're going to be carrying that around for maybe three months, six months, eight months. You might be doing it. And so my character, I was so relieved because Marshall Bell, I was loading him down with shit. So sometimes he would think that it was nothing in the bag and I would get the bag and really put shit in there, right? He was like, this bag is heavy, right? Because I would tell him, don't give him the bag, dude, until John says action or get, we get close to it. So, you know, prop guy stand next to him and goes, give me the bag. He would give him the bag. This shit is heavy. And we're going to the scene, right? <laughs> right? So when Marshall's character dies in the film, I actually had to start carrying shit around, you know? Mm -hmm. um, Paying like, your dues, man. Yeah, man. And I'm like, really, dude? Really? And I was like, who's going to carry this shit? I don't want to carry this shit for another, what, month? What? Come on, man, stop. You know, so it was really, it was really funny. We, we had a lot of fun. So it's those experiences. You know what I mean? Well, for you, and, I mean, go ahead. No, and it just, you know, it's just always trying to make that situation, a real situation, a real moment, a real moment all the time. Well, as you say, in, in, in real moments, so for example, as I said, I mean, like, mm -hmm. like me, you've, you've had the opportunity to play, you know, police officers and in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an era where, you know, it was climate, but not like the climate that we're living in right True. now. True. And for you, for example, have you ever experienced, I was asked this question a couple of weeks ago by somebody, um, right. just of, of our growth in the business, mm -hmm. from when you started to now, one, have you ever experienced, especially growing up in South Central, right. uh, discrimination for yourself Absolutely. Whether it be auditioning for a role or working on a set, or absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and on and on top of that, how would you feel for yourself, number one, in this climate that we're living in? Because you were talking about before of like not staying in a bubble and getting typecasted. And for me, I mean, yeah. I'm always known for used to playing the FBI the detective, the yeah, the yeah, and. Right now, you know, we're, we're on a hiatus right now because of the pandemic, but we've been shooting the Christopher Dorner series, right. which is coming out. Right. And I remember when we first started putting out any bit of promotion for it, you know, there was a lot of negative. And we hadn't even, like, in the sense of, like, put out what the actual story was going to be about. Because I've always said, 
anyone that knows that Christopher Garner story, right? What you've seen in the media, I mean, don't get me wrong. What the man did was horrendous. Exactly. Innocent lives were taken. Exactly. But there's only been one side of the story that's been told. Yeah. There is, and I always say it. This is our, this is our this is our platform for the series. There is three sides to every story: the heroes, the victims, and the truth. And a lot of the things that he talked about in his manifesto are things that we're living seven, eight years later. Yeah. In full live color with the George Floyds. Well, he's, know, he, was, he was embedded in that culture. You got to remember that. You know, I, I have cousins that just retired. You know, when you're mm -hmm. embedded into that culture, you're embedded into that culture. And you can be a bad guy embedded or you can just be a guy that, look, y'all do your thing. I'm going to work. I'm going to do my thing. I'm going to stay safe. I'm going to make it through this job, and I'm going to get my pension. And I'm going to actually mm -hmm. go fishing. That's what I'm going to do. And y'all can have this, right? You can have that attitude, or you can, get, you can play the game. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, for me, I've experienced, I'm glad I did, did not experience any of those things at the present moment within, let's say, the last five years. Uh, but I remember working on a movie of the week in Arizona, and it was hot, and I'm playing this detective. Mm -hmm. And my son is innocent. Uh, Nick Stalls, he starred in that. And remember, that was the launch of his career. Dude's so good. Uh, and I remember walking into the uh, craft service trailer. And the gentleman said, what are you doing here? You're not supposed to be in here to get him like, oh, well, listen, sir, I'm one of the lead actors, and I don't care. He went outside and get some water. I'm like, mm -hmm. what? So I was just about to grab. I was just about to grab and just grab his, the collar of his shirt just in the way so I can get some of his carotid. Mm -hmm. And kind of like, you know, like, you're going to blank out in the second tail. Because there was like a ice cream machine behind him, you know, that you could open it up and get your ice cream. So I was going to pin him against that and just get that leverage and get a nice, good fulcrum on him. Mm -hmm. And I just, it was, the urge was so there because just the way he, I can just, I can just see him. I can hear him saying the N word while he was mm -hmm. talking to me. I can just hear it. And I was just going to, I was like, oh man, oh man. Okay. I already saw it. I saw exactly where I was going, what I was going to do. So I turned around and walked out, got on my phone, called my agent and said, I'm going to go stand over there somewhere until somebody calls production and lets them know that that man said that. Because if anybody says anything, anything to me right now, I'm going to just explode mm -hmm. because I can just see him saying the N word. I can hear it. I can, it was just, he, it was, I can smell it off of him. Mm -hmm. He meant that. You know, and a couple of days later, a couple of days earlier, I was leaving uh, the mall and uh, this gentleman, <laughs> this gentleman said, you know, effing N word. And I went, what? And I looked and he just peeled off. <laughs> and I'm like, because I made a move. Mm -hmm. I made a move. So um, but have you ever had to like find yourself in a situation? I mean, I, I know at times where you, you, you feel it. You 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 know what they're thinking, but yeah. you're in a situation where you're in this balance of trying. Okay, do I stay professional and and suck it up, right? Or there's that other hard level where it's like, okay, how do I make change by staying quiet? Yeah. Because it's like. It's almost to the point where, like, you know, when people people have said, and this this goes in in the in the climate we're dealing with right now. I'm sure you've heard politicians. I'm sure you've heard, yeah. you know, anytime there's a situation that happens with a person of color, and they and and you always have that one spokesperson that says, or even friends that you have in your inner circle that say, right. you know, well, um, I haven't experienced that. Like it doesn't, or it doesn't happen here as much in my mm. neighborhood mm. or um i've never been in a situation where i've experienced you know racism or yeah. they say well i have black friends right 
so I'm not a racist or whatever, et cetera, et cetera. And to me, it's like there's this this balance of like almost to the point where like we're supposed to just take it and keep moving. Right. And to me, it's like, you know, I, I, I don't know about you, like in retrospect of like what attracts you when you get a script or you get presented with an offer, what attracts you to that role? Is it more of... I, I can tell you what it is. It's always, it's always how they have developed that character. Mm -hmm. Because if I'm going to embody that character he has, I, it, it, it needs to be something for me to attach myself to. And for sure, um, it, it's got to be a character with uh, gravitas, with intellect, with power. Mm -hmm. um, and even if he doesn't have much to say, you know, the presence is still there. And he's always treated like a man, not because of his skin color. He's a man. Yes. And that is one of the first things I look for. Uh, not the guy that's the through line, but the guy all the time. Even if it's second, third, fourth cat on the, on the call sheet, six cat, seven cat, number 41 cat. Mm -hmm. You know, I was number 41 on Badlands because of third, third season. Okay. So even with that, there was something there that I know that every day I come to work, and this goes back to what you were saying earlier, when you approach anyone, in any circumstances, on the street, on the job, the way you present yourself, there's something that they can see in your aura. Okay, I need to treat him just like he's treating me right now. He's a no fuck about kind of guy. Mm -hmm. So we're good, right? Even well, if do they, you feel that? Do you feel that that work? Because I mean, I know even if they hate me, even, even if I think they don't like me, even if I mean, there's been times I walked in rooms mm -hmm. and there was some guy there that was just like, oh no. We're not casting that cat, and this is the reason why. I've had, I've had it all. But do you feel, it's, do you feel it's, it, it's because of, you know, because I think, I think what it boils down to, and I always say, like, you know, when you have a, me and you have personalities. We right. have a presence. We have a, right. a, a strong demeanor. We, we have conviction about who we are as right. black men. Exactly. And, and that's what it is. a lot of times people look at that situation as, I don't even say if it's arrogance, because it's not. It's not. It's just. It's just who you are and where you come from. Exactly. I've had an agent. And... I, I, I've had an agent at, at a. I'm not going to mention the name. We're in a big mm -hmm. room with all these people, and I remember we were talking, and one of the lead partners said, "Would you tone yourself down?" And I'm like, well, "Would I tone myself down for what? What, what are you talking about?" And he goes, "Well, mm -hmm. you know, you have this present, you have this, that," and I just straight said, "Would you ask Tom Cruise to tone himself down?" And I've worked with Tom. On collateral, and honestly, that's I mean, it's good that you said his name because it's like people what they see on TV, and I'm sure you understand this as an entertainer as well. People have a hard time seeing reality, yeah, and real. And yeah. I work with a lot of counts, and to me, Tom not only is a general, like a complete general on set, a professional a guy who's a perfectionist. But straight up, one of the nicest yeah. down-to-earth guys yeah. that you'll ever meet. And, and, and he's very passionate and he's very yeah. loving. And, and, and it's the same with Keeper Southern. Like, I remember, yeah. just like you said with Dennis Hopper, like, you know, you walk on certain sets with certain people for the first time. And you've, you've, you've admired their work from afar. And you don't really know what you're going to get. Because I always say, you know, your heroes sometimes disappoint you. And... I remember that walking happened. onto that set, exactly, nervous, scared as shit, deer in headlights, and I'm watching Kiefer and even Tom walk around this room, and, you know, PAs are running after them, and, and, and they're not even saying nothing. It's set shit. This it's set off. shit. It's just what it is. It's it set is. shit, but and you get past it. Both of these guys are, are super tiny, like very small, individual guys. Yeah. I'm six yeah. foot three. Yeah. And they're like five four, five five, five six, roughly. Yeah. And you're seeing this this commanding presence of the sense of who they are. And I'm and I'm just I was literally just in awe watching. I'm going, okay, but when you and this is where I have the, the which you can maybe answer to this, it's like do you do you feel there's a difference in the sense of where, okay, guys like that 
their their intimidation aspect of their characters because Kiefer is very commanding. When you when you look at him, you always think in Jack Bar, you know, always. But out, off camera, he's the nicest guy. But when it comes to work, he don't play. Yeah. And those guys are considered, you know, when they have that loud, put about bravado, you know, attitude, they're considered, you know, general professionals, yeah. guys that you can respect. But when it's a black person in our business put into that situation, whether it's a female or whether it's a male, when you come in there to work and you come in there and, and you, you know exactly who you are as a person, as you say, you, you know, my, my mentors just tell me actors don't act, they feel. They feel the emotion, they feel the scene, they feel the presence of every layer and they try to take every layer and bring it into a role. So for you, when you say, okay. Hang, hang on a second, I have somebody yep. at my door. Okay. It's open. <laughs> Still on my call here. <laughs> uh, I love it. So okay, so ahead. yeah, you, you, so you said before earlier where you were like, you know, when the person said for you to tone it down. And we're always told to tone it down and because we're looked at as not in the same aspect of, because you would never tell a Tom Cruise to turn it down on set. You would never tell no, a you're TV not, you're not, to You're not going to ask me to tone myself down. For what? Why am I going to tone myself down? So, you know, those are the... Do you think there's a difference? Like a different, there's, a, there's a different level of, <laughs> of respect in the sense of where they're considered what they are. But if we are... Of course, of course. Who we are... And who we are, it takes a lot. Problem, it takes, it, that that cast never dress, You know, I don't want to work with Sherman. That guy's yeah. too. It it takes a lot for you to get to a place to where you're respected, mm -hmm. as an as an artist, as an individual, as a man, as a black man, all those things. And you know, it, it takes time to do so. You know, you play your cards right, and, and like I said, you know, there's only four living rooms in Hollywood, so. What I'm going to do is make sure. I had an acting teacher who used to say this all the time. They may not like me but they will respect my work. So, um, but I, I take it a, a step further. You know, we're all doing the same thing. We're all achieving the same goal. And you can tell when you step on certain people's set, um, when you notice what I do is always, when I'm projecting myself into a space where I'm gonna be working, I'm not just thinking about my fellow actors or the producers or the writers or the showrunner. I'm thinking about craft service you know, the custodians. I'm thinking about, I got to get along with everybody, and especially the wardrobe department, you know, because they can make your life a living hell by, you know, putting you in some too tight shit or giving you some wrong shoes. Oh, we have to order those shoes and you in those shoes for a while, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I make friends with everybody. It, it's always good morning to everybody on the set and you make that set yours, no matter if I'm there with uh, whomever it is I'm working with. It's always good morning to everybody. And hey, everyone, you know, oh, Sherman's here. It makes everybody's day go better. And grandma used to tell me, you know, black folks are the first to be fired and the last to be hired. So, you know, with that in mind, uh, you make sure that you have the proper attitude that you can get along with me. And you know this as well as I do. You get jobs, I would say, basically, maybe 20%, 25%, maybe a little bit more, depends on, okay, he can act, but how is he on the set? How is she on the set? You know, because some of my favorite actors, you know, they have these reputations and they're not getting jobs today. Uh, the career is starting all over again after they've been in the game 30, 40 years, right? Uh, so, which is just, it's just insane, but everybody does get a second chance. Uh, but you got to come back stronger. So for, for me and my mindset, it's always about treating people, everyone with respect. And uh, sometimes uh, it's hard because you can walk on a set and see you can count how many black folks is there. What's their yeah. ethnicity ratio, I used to say. And it wasn't until I got to Dublin, Ireland, and when I went over there for, when they introduced my character, I'm looking at all these faces from all these different countries. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. It was actually, actually like, it was the UN. And I remember going into season three, I had a conversation, conversation with Al, uh, our showrunner, and he said, listen, okay, yeah, this is a, a dystopian uh, society, but don't you think after a nuclear holocaust that it just wouldn't be white people that survived or black people or, you know, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. You know, there's going to be survivors. And this is 500 years afterwards. So we're making our show look like America would look. And I remember one day, um, I just recently started talking about this. I remember one day I was heading back to the trailer and I'm looking at all these black faces and all these black faces behind and in front of the camera and they're from everywhere and from you know yugoslavia from from russia uh, from germany from everywhere and i had to take a minute and i walked behind my trailer and i just started crying profusely i couldn't stop because it was it was the most beautiful thing i've seen in a long time to to be on a set where we had not one knucklehead actor not one and you know we had a very big cast and we're family and not only for us, but everybody. We hung out with everybody. Mm -hmm. And we involved everybody, no matter who you were. And that was probably only the second time this ever happened to me in my career. Mm -hmm. And it just, it, it just takes me aback. And there was never, I mean, we had to kind of come up with stuff to be pissy about something. So we would play, who would you beat up? <laughs> so we would, <laughs> <laughs> we would, we would, wait, wait, we would, like, Daniel Wu started that. So, yeah, Daniel, I just said it. So he wrote, he was, he was in the conversation with somebody. So there was, like, somebody that, you know, like, his guy was the caterer. Hold yeah. up one second, hold up one second. Yeah, go for it. For the guys coming into the room, guys, welcome to Hot Topics Radio TV. We're here with my man, Sherman Augustus. <laughs> so coming into the Badlands, Stranger Things, and The Young and the Restless. If you guys have some questions you want to ask, Please drop them in the comments below, and we will try to answer them towards the end of this podcast. Go ahead, man. All right. So, um, so I remember one time, Gary was our caterer was kind of off every now and then with his with the food we were getting, and I, one day, <laughs> Daniel had said something about Gary, and Gary was walking by, and so we started playing "Who Would You Beat Up." So we would pick people you know, the crew members, because, you know, we had some you know, box of cats, you know, we're mm -hmm. working in Ireland, man, you know, there's some, some, some tough cats over there, man, you know, some really cool cats and really cool people. And so, yeah, they would play who would you beat up because it got to a point sometimes where it, we weren't bored on the set, but we had to just, because we had no set drama. We had mm -hmm. no set drama. And there was a particular actor that was offered that role. And uh, I remember one night uh, and I, I'm a fan of him, his, and we worked together before, and uh, I respect him, you know, all the way around, period. Uh, and I remember him leaning to me and telling me who it was, and because everybody was so nice mm -hmm. to me, and the crew was like, they were dreading if that other actor got that gig. And, um, you know, we I talked about that with a couple of the... Uh, cast members and, and, you know, people on the crew. And I can say that they worked so hard every day and they just didn't want any, any disruptions, I can say, um, because the, sh the ship had been running smoothly for two seasons already. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to bring an element in there that they already perceived was going to be bad, you know, which I'm pretty sure wouldn't. Um, was interesting, but as far as that's concerned, that was the only drama that um, we had uh, on on that. They were expecting a certain actor to come in, and that actor didn't, you know, he turned it down, thankfully. Uh, so uh, that was the first time I've ever, you know, the, the second time I've ever really encountered uh, a situation where everybody knew they had something special. Now with Stranger Things, you walk on that set, they know they have something special. So tell me yeah, about Stranger Things. You, you, what, what is your, your character going to be for this and when, when we first uh, see him? He's a, he's a lieutenant colonel, and basically uh, I'm there to, I can't say, I can't say that. I'm there to uh, basically put an end to, and finding out the reasons why all these things have been happening and the whole thing with the Russians. 
Uh, and uh, he's there to uh, kick ass and chew bubble gum. And he's got plenty of bubble gum. So he's going to kick ass and chew bubble gum at the same time. Uh, it's, it's a really cool character. I'm looking forward to getting doing more of the other stuff that I have. I have some meaty, really good stuff to do. But it's, it's going to be all about the eyes, man. It's going to be all about the eyes. This guy is just, this guy is just like, you know, he's no joke. So it's just all about the eyes. I get to go straight Kurosawa, man. I get to just like, you know, what did you say? You know, it's just, it's going to be great. Love it. I mean, one thing I can say about your career, which I've, I've always admired, I've always respected. And I, and I, I think, no, oh, thanks, you know, thank there's you, thank very, you, thank there's you. very few people I can say in this business who, as a black man, as a black performer, as a black artist, this is why, you know, when there was always, you know, people called Christoph the Denzel of daytime. Mm -hmm. And I've always looked at you as the Denzel of primetime because of the simple fact that you've never, when we talk about stereotypes, I mean, there, you coming from South Central, you know, I'm sure in the beginning there's an expectation for yeah. you to play these characters, the gangster, the thug, you know. All that, all the, that. And all that. nothing wrong with those things. Nothing wrong with them. No matter, nothing wrong with those things if you, if you want to do them. But it's just not for me. That's exactly. not the story I, I want to tell. What I've noticed with you is that, you know, I, I don't know if it's, I think it's a testament to your talent, that you've been able to, to have this longevity over 20 year plus years, you know, to play not only great characters, but characters of true representation yeah. of what That's what I look for. That's what I should have articulated earlier. That's exactly what I look for. You know, is exactly what you said. Like even on NCIS or even necessarily, you know, on um, uh, what was that, that show? Uh, the one that uh, oh my god. Um, they used to like figure thing bones and and I, and I and I always said I'm like you know this guy whether it be detective Weber whether it be playing a, a, a doctor or a scientist or a lawyer or a cop he's always been able to have a strong sense of class integrity um, representation of somebody of sophistication you know, where it's not where, you know, he's walking in the room and you're automatically going, I'm sure you, when you know character, like, yeah, I know this guy's going, I know what he's going to play. Before he even says two words, you know he's going to be the end up being the villain. Right, right. And to me, even where, you know, you look at a character like Moon and Into the Badlands, you know, I mean, just reading the research and reading, you know, the feedback that I've heard from your fan base in retrospect to that character, is that when you, before you came on that show, and it's no disrespect to the other actors mm -hmm. that are on there, but what I've read over and over and over and over again is that when you came on the show, it was like a bolt of electricity with this character. Like he, he implemented something where he wasn't bad, he wasn't good, but he stood for something. He stood yeah. for principle. He stood yeah. for, for character and and his approach in the sense, number one, as a a leader. And to me, I look at that where, yes, you know, there's an, it, it goes back to, for example, in the sense of like Chris Dorner situation. Yeah. What he did was wrong in the sense of innocent lives were taken. But sometimes you have to store a little chaos into a situation to restore order. And mm -hmm. when I look at Moon's character, and I look at even the characters that you've played per se, is that there's always been this gray and white where it's like there's a mystery, and you may, exactly what you said, you may not in first like him, but you will learn to respect him. And I yeah. think that's where, to me, the, the, the layer in the sense where, you know, I can see the realism in you as a person? I was, in a, I was in a place. I try to look at it. If I was a songwriter, singer-songwriter, I'm going to use what's real and my real emotions. So I was in a place then 
where uh, I had like, I don't know, man, I met with everybody in town on this show, that show, and I was just auditioning. I was just like doing the Sherman Shuffle, I like to say that. I'm out here Sherman Shuffling like you know, big time. <laughs> I'm just, yeah, that, 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 you know, all that stuff, right? And, you know, in the rooms with, with the people that make the decisions, over at this studio, over doing that. And then I had, uh, you know, the thing with Badlands is my mother had called me and she said, Sherm, you need to really check out this show, Badlands. I'm not watching nothing, Ma. I'm not watching that because, you know, I have martial arts experience and I don't know any about, anything about that show. And, you know, I don't see no brothers on the show. Click clack. Right? Like on like a regular basis. But I'm like, okay. So I started watching the show. I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm going to get on the show. So it just worked out. I put it out there and it worked out. Now, doing all of that stuff and then I put myself on tape for it and it was a really emotional scene. Two big scenes and very emotional. Uh, and so uh, I remember where I was emotionally and I didn't hear anything for about three weeks. There was interest and I didn't hear anything for about three weeks. And I actually went to my agent's office that day to fire them. And I'm like, nah, I'm not going to do it. I won't do it. I'm not even going to ask about Badlands. So I go over to my buddy's house and oddly enough, we're sitting up, you know, playing music, working on some tracks and drinking Jameson. And I get back home. And at five in the morning, I get a call from Susan Holmes. You know, she goes, good morning, Sherman. This is Susan Holmes from the production over here at Ireland. Why don't you get you on the plane to treat her today to come over to Ireland for Badlands? I'm like, what? Now, I already got a hangover. I got a hangover. I'm like, what? You know, call me back. I'm fucking hung up, you know? Mm -hmm. So I was in this space where I was just sequestering myself because I had been auditioning so much. And that's what Moon did. So again, I put myself in that situation to where I knew that guy. Mm -hmm. And we had these scenes and he said that in dialogue, this is the reason why I'm here. My, you know, my, my wife, my, my son was killed. And I was just over auditioning and just going through the rigors and shuffling and everything. And just, I do that all the time. And, you know, COVID, this whole COVID thing, other than doing self tapes, uh, uh, those are the only times that basically I'm having human contact. So it's easy for me. So again, I can apply what we're going through right now to the Lieutenant Colonel because of where we are. And I can use the pandemic, but definitely I felt isolated when I was before I got Badlands, and I just took that in there with me. Now the thing of it was, was to for season three to find another place to go. So um, with the fact that I got a gig, I knew I was going to go work for a whole year. You know, then Sherm came out of his his bunker. You know. Went outside to work out, you know, talk to people at the park, you know, all these things, you know, hung out with some of my friends a little bit more, you know, to get that back. Because exactly when Emily's character comes to uh, recruit Nathaniel, you know, the only reason why he did that was revenge for Sonny, right? So for me, Badlands was revenge. It was to everybody that, you know, had me come in and do the shuffle, you know, for seven, eight months. So basically, like, you know, take that. Take that. I'm over here swinging the sword. Take that. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I know it's, it's, it's funny, but. Uh, uh, how have you, I mean, for you, how have you, since this pandemic, I mean, how, right. have, you, how have you adjusted? Because I mean, I know for me, I mean, the first, I mean, um, I mean, I had COVID and mm -hmm. it laid me out for. Wow, man. Two and a half months. And Blessings, brother. Blessings. It was, it was, I don't wish I should have fought anyone. No. But I know getting, after, you know, recovering from it, I said to myself, I'm like, you know, I need to stay busy doing whatever. I mean, right now production's halted, so like, okay, I'm gonna do things that I've put off. Yeah. How for you has it been adjusting to this this uh -oh. this new world? Well, for me, you know, we're uh, me and my business partners, we have a, a, a plethora of, of stuff that's out there right now. Mm -hmm. Um and I can name one where well maybe I shouldn't, but one is uh we have the go ahead. Uh, we're still waiting from, from someone to in, from MGM to let us know uh, if we can proceed or not. We can't get anybody, but we have the nod to do uh, Truck Turner. So okay. we're going, our Truck Turner is going to be more of a, uh, he's going to be more of a, uh, well, I, I'll just 
leave it at that. Um, it's going to be a different, a different thing. And we have a couple other movies. There's one or two movies that I'm a producer on. That's uh, two movies I'm a producer on that's coming out. One I'm in, uh, one I do a cameo in. And we're working on a graphic novel. So artwork has just been um, shared between us and the illustrator. Looks great. Okay. Um, and we had already pitched that to uh, Mike Richardson uh, at Dark Horse three years ago, right? We had to go down for Virus, and Mike Richardson produced that along with Gail and her. So we were able to pitch it. So now, you know, we're moving forward, we're getting stuff together, we're gonna present all these things, you know, the storyboard, uh, a couple of, uh, uh, couple of uh, patterns and um, some stuff, you know, and it's gonna be, look, it's gonna look great, it's gonna look beautiful, it's gonna be a really beautiful uh, graphic novel, and of course, turn that graphic novel into a limited series. Okay. Uh, so there's that. So we've been staying busy with that kind of stuff. Uh, you know this as well as I do. You know, creativity for artists never stop. You know, it could be anything. You know, you can do anything. So uh, the creativity will just keeps going, and you don't let any of this stop and stop you. And I have these spurts that I'm shooting it because of they have to shoot in these different kind of ways now. Uh, so I get a lot of time to really think about certain things and uh, upcoming scenes that I have not shot yet, which I can't wait to do because every day there's something more creative that comes to mind. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, again, I, uh, the less is more with this guy right now. And that's where I'm at right now. I'm over everything in this year, just over it. So the less I talk about it, the better. So I get to take that in with me with this character it's just have you had to shoot so like since since this, this yeah yeah we we we, the, uh... we 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 shot we shot some stuff and um one scene in particular where i don't say a word okay not a word and there's one two three four five there's like seven people in that shot and they have all the dialogue i don't say anything and the brothers came around and just said, dude, nothing to say. You're on. This is because it's a very pivotal role for them. It was like, I, from what they were telling me, um, they didn't know they were going to keep the guy or not. It needed the right actor. And I'm not saying, you know, I'm the right dude. Nothing like that. Uh, I feel blessed and fortunate to be able to, like, breathe life into this guy. But again, it's real. It's where I'm at right now. So... Well, what are you, for you, I was asking, like, in the sense of adjustment, like, adjusting to the, the mask and the protocols. You know, it's like you? the first 15 minutes, you go like, okay, this is how we're living. We have to lean into this. Mm -hmm. You know, COVID, when you get there uh, and you get your text message, okay, you're clear to work. And for them, they use two different masks. Uh, outside, there's one. And then when you walk inside, there's an N95 and you wear goggles, and then they have a personal tray for you to put your stuff in. Okay. And basically, you as the actor, in between takes, are the only one that has, that you don't have a mask on. Okay. At least when I was shooting. You know, everybody okay. else had the mask up. And then uh, we shoot, and then if we're taking a break, everybody mask up, and they have your own little separate area where the actors go, you know, your own little bubble, which is fine. Mm -hmm. um, so... And it didn't take long at all. I mean, it's business. They're cranking through it. If you got the right people, the right components, the right assets, everybody loves their job, it's business as usual. It's done. It's business as usual. You just have more people on the set now because you have all these special health regulations that you have to follow. So you just but how do you adjust think to that, it. How do you think that will fare for the future of the business if this stays for the next two, three years like this? It, in you know, the sense it, of like... For, for, I mean, for example, like shows like Daytime, Young and the Restless, Bold and the right. Beautiful, they're in an enclosed set. So they yeah. can keep a smaller cast, smaller crew. Right. Say, for example, like you're shooting a, a production like Badlands, where it's massive sets, tons of extras, tons of people. How do you feel that that's going to, either it's going to hurt the industry or you it's, feel it's, it's, it's business. It's business as usual. It's business as usual. You know, everybody just has to adapt. Everybody adapts. You know, stunt performers are adapting. Uh, like I said, everybody's bubbled off. 
um, more money now because you have to have, you know, you have to provide protection. Mm -hmm. So that adds more money into your budget. So budgets are going to go up. This is the reason why right now it's really hard to get an independent film, you know, like your $2 million independent film done. You know, it's yeah. hard to do those. A $1.5 million film done, you know. Yeah, because if thing you lose one, two, ten, fifteen yeah. days of production, can someone get sick? You're shut down. You're shut. You're shut, and then, you're shut and then, down. And then that's like, that could be a huge part of your budget. And then you don't, you can't make oh. that up. And if it happens again, then it's a wrap. That's why I tell it's my friends, I'm like, you know, studios like AMC and CBC, I mean, CBS and NBC and Amazon, they can get away with it because their budgets are through yeah. the roof. They, they can yeah. afford to have the right people in place paying for that. But for the smaller guy who's right. not as big, if you're on a, on, a, on, a, on a show like that, even if it's a good show, right. I, I'm right. seeing now, like, they're putting their money into the shows that have been, like, when you look at, like, a show like Power or a show like Chicago PD, like shows that have had like six, seven, eight seasons and their fan base, I mean, they could be off for two years and yeah. their fan base will wait for yeah. that show to come back. But yeah. other shows, they don't have that luxury. So they have that luxury. Like, do you feel that it will, it will be... If the numbers aren't there, they're not going to spend the money. Like right now, if, if we were shooting Badlands, mm -hmm. Badlands was... I was told was more expensive than Game of Thrones. They shot up in Belfast and, you know, we shot down in our, uh, Dublin. And uh, we would hear stories that our budget for a particular, because uh, they shoot in blocks for a particular two, a block of episodes costs more. Well, I than... got a fan saying here, Gem Gemini Nura 2020. Yeah. I love you so much. I've been a big fan since I was little. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a little. OK. All right. You know, I, I you know, because, you know, I went to school with Jesus and Moses. So, you know, uh, you know, a little. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, <laughs> that's crazy, man. Um, but anyway, it's it's, you know, what, what we were talking about before. You know, I, I, I lost my train of thought there. Because and I was thinking we're about the talking fan. about in the sense of number one of like. The yeah, forward. Basically, basically, if they were shooting Badlands right now, mm -hmm. it would be the budget would be astronomical because you have two full units. You have a fight unit and a drama unit, and that's a hundred plus people on each unit. So, you know, it would be crazy. Were I you, wouldn't want Were to... you surprised when the show was canceled? Very much so. Very much so. But you know I what? There, I mean, for me, it se it seemed like. You know, it, it was it was one of those shows that like didn't get the love necessarily from the network. It it was it was a network thing. But it was the a fan base thing. was like a cult, and it seemed yeah. to like grow. It's still growing. It's, it, it's still growing. It's still growing. And you know, I can say that somewhere down the line, they will be. They will. They will have satisfaction. Trust me. I I personally feel. Do you think point. it could be brought back for another network? Uh, I think, you know, there was always talk about uh, an animation, you know, and uh, we almost did the spinoff. It was almost going to be a spinoff. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but at some point, at some point, I think, because AMC owns it outright right now, and, mm -hmm. you know, they heard it from the fans of the show. Uh, and I get where AMC is coming from, so I'm not going to get all like you know mad and all that kind of stuff. It was an expensive show, a lot of components, you know. Uh, everybody on that show, from the technical side to the actors, everybody they're busy because they're good at what they do. And uh, it doesn't matter if they worked in the camera department or if they worked in stunts. Everybody's busy, and they're doing major stuff right now. So at some point, somebody's going to get the idea that, hey, let's get back, let's get the band back together. Mm -hmm. And when the band gets back together, it's going to be bananas. See, what I, what, I, what I read a lot today, and I'm not sure if you're aware of this, uh, there's been a petition sort of started from your fans from Badlands. Oh, wow. They want you to play the next Black Panther. What? 
Uh, well, thank you, but you know, uh, could you I, see yourself stepping into that role? You feel that's too much of a weight to carry? There's, you know, there's there's other characters that came into uh, into that whole, you know, as the comic goes on. There's all these other characters. There's some other characters I would love to go in there and do. I really would. I really would. Um, I think they're going to do the Siri thing for a minute. I don't know how they're going to lace how they're going to lace this whole thing up, but it's going to be interesting. And um, I was just talking to someone who's a stunt performer who's going to be on that. They start June, July, sometime in Atlanta. So, uh, yeah, there's, there's something else uh, in the, is it Marvel? It's in the DC universe that uh, we had a conversation about. So we'll see. We'll talk. You and I can talk about that later. I don't want to talk about it right now. Uh, but it's another, it's a really huge um, it's going to be huge. And but if that to... role was presented to you? If it was presented to me, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't I, I don't think I would just just jump at the opportunity to do it. There is a conversation that needs to be had. You know, where are do, we? Do you because... feel the similarities between his, like the Black Panther character and Moon? I, you know, I would have, yeah, yeah, definitely. There's, there's some, the whole thing about, you know, protecting his people and about what they're doing and about, you know, these things that come out of Wakanda. And it was the same thing about Nathaniel Moon, his honor. You know, it was about, it was about the honor. It was about duty mm -hmm. uh, and committing oneself to uh, what they were sent there to do, you know. And I really, really dug that about that character because he was so honorable and so true. And there was nothing that was going to derail him off of his, uh, his journey of accepting the truth that he was here for a reason. And that reason is to do this or do that or whatever it, whatever it was. And when he lost his honor, when he stepped away from it, because for me, the way I broke it down is the killing basically hollowed him out a lot. Mm -hmm. And how do you have a conscience about that? And then once he, you know, it's the Terminator, you know, he's just boom, boom, boom. And, and then all of a sudden you finish your objective and the repercussions of what you've done come home to haunt you. Then what do you do from there? So um, that was interesting in itself. There's a, there's a lot of stuff that I did that, you know, we never saw. Uh, but they were able to put all these things into dialogue, which I just right. latched on to. That was so important for me to do that character. It was, you know, it was so me. It was so what I want to be, that character. So, I mean, so from playing playing these heavy, I was watching a scene today, and there was a heavy action scene where you're right. running in slow motion and slashing and dashing. And yeah, yeah, yeah. You, what, what, is, what is your your process after coming from a, such an intense scene, you know, after you've shot something like that. You always, you know, you always, as a kid, you want those kind of scenes because we see those big scenes, you know. Mm -hmm. you know, I saw the big scene the year before, you know, Game of Thrones with, with Jon Snow out there and the horses was coming and all that kind of stuff. So uh, when we did that particular scene, uh, it was so cold that day where you did not want to move. And even moving hurt. But it was really cool to do because everybody was so committed. They had rehearsed that scene. You know, everybody was, all the stunt performers were rehearsing their movements and stuff. And they plotted out a, pl a place where I was going to go. And, and, you know, and uh, Callie jumped through that fire. That was Callie. Callie was, like, doing this thing and jumped through that fire. I'm like, yo, Callie, way to jump through that fire. You know, my, mm -hmm. my, stunt, my stunt, a stunt double. Um, but it was so much 